Hi, today I want to talk a little bit about how a noise gate works and how we're designing our noise gate. If you have a look at the screen, what I've got here uh, in Isotope RX is a test input. So the test input has a 20 hertz sine wave and the volume of the sine wave is gradually decaying up to about halfway through the test and then it goes back up to full volume and sustains till the end. Um, so what the noise gate should do when I process it on this test input is it should be um, watching the volume and when the volume drops below a threshold that I set then it should close down the gate and turn off the sound. So this is useful um, especially for electric guitars with distortion on them because they tend to make a lot of noise when you're not playing the guitar. Um, and we're able to tolerate the noise when you're playing because the sound of playing will cover up the noise. But we don't want to hear that buzz going on when you're not playing. So the noise gate is supposed to fix that problem. I'm going to run the noise gate that I have here and let's have a look at what it actually does. Um, here's my noise gate. I'm going to set uh, attack time of 1 millisecond and release time of 10 milliseconds. So this means that when it detects volume above the threshold, it's going to take 1 millisecond to open the, open the gate and let the sound through. And when it detects that the volume has fallen below the threshold, within 10 milliseconds, it will close everything down. So let's run this. And my output comes in comma separated values. I'm running this to see plots and convert to wave. This uh, software is called Mathematica. Close this and open a new version. There it goes. So now what you see on the screen is um, the volume is decaying as we expected. And when we hit uh, a threshold volume, suddenly closes off and there's this silence, which was not here a moment ago when we weren't running the noise gate. But there's something else here that I don't want there. Let's have a look at the spectrum. Um, so you can see that uh, although I'm at 30 hertz, I've got some kind of noise going on all the way up to 3 kilohertz uh, in this spectrum, which certainly doesn't sound right. Um, I'll let you listen to this sound. And you can hear that something's going on in this range where there's kind of a, a funny buzzing noise. It certainly doesn't sound like a 30 hertz tone. So let's have a look at what's going on with that noise. Um, I want to move to where it, where it starts happening. I think it starts, well, it starts from right from the beginning. You can see it right here. So let's just zoom in right there. So what's going on here is this, this wave is at such a low frequency that with my 10 millisecond release time I can actually get the gate partly closed before the the wave finishes a cycle so if we if we look at if we take this as uh, one cycle of the wave what's going on is that there's a part of this this wave that's above the threshold and there's a part that's below and you can you can see exactly where it is so uh, right here, there's a little jagged um, bump, and there's another one here. So what's going on is uh, the threshold value is right here. So from here, from, from like here to about here, this range of the wave is below the threshold that I'm supposed to close the volume. So what's happening is as I'm, I'm down in this, in this range, like right from here, the noise gate is saying, ah, you're below the threshold, and it starts to close down the volume. And it's closing down the volume, and that's, that's causing the wave to have this, to sort of curve this way. And then when it hits this point, now we're back above the threshold, so it says, oops, we were wrong, we, we shouldn't have closed that down, and now we've got to open it back up. And so the noise gate is opening and closing twice with every time the wave oscillates. So it's, it's happening once here, and it's happening again here. And so I think what we could say uh, to explain it in just a few words is our release time is so fast that this noise gate is mistakenly closing itself when the volume hasn't actually dropped below the threshold. What's happened is just that the wave has part of its, part of its wave is, is near zero. 
So we need to stop that, obviously. Um, and there are several ways that noise gates do that. The very simplest way would be for me to increase my release time. So I'll go up to 70 milliseconds and let's run it again. And we'll have a reload here. And reload the file and see what happens with the longer release time. So it looks like some of that jaggedness is gone. Let's see what happens in the frequency domain. We can see that there's, uh, there's not all that high frequency noise going on anymore. Things look much, much better. You still see some kind of halo around the, the 30 hertz tone, and that's happening mostly because of the visualizer in RX6. Is, um, it's just not, it's not easy to, to pinpoint uh, the exact gain of a very low frequency um, because of some limitations of the fast Fourier transform. So <clears throat> things are looking much better here, but I still see that there's a little bit of uh, this opening and closing action which is causing some distortion here. And if we look at the waveform, I think you'll be able to see that. Maybe you won't. Yeah, you can see it. So we can, once again, we can see where the threshold is. Like this wave is now starting to get very near the threshold and this right here is dropped below the threshold and so it just started to close a little bit and then the tip of, of this peak, the very tip of it, popped back above the threshold and it opened back up. And so it's creating this, this zippering tone just right here. But because my envelope follower is, is having a much slower release time, what happens back in this range is that even though the wave spends some time below the threshold, the envelope follower is taking a long time before it actually starts closing down on the, on the gate, which means that it gives the wave time to recover and get back above the threshold before the gate actually closes, and that way you, you don't get this noise leaking through. But um, it still does leak through at the end period here, and it leaks through here just because in this case, like 90% of the entire wave is below the threshold. And that makes it difficult for this particular envelope follower to, um, to handle this without a, a little bit of distortion there. Um, so I, I've been thinking about uh, several different options for how to handle this. And if you look at many of the noise gates that are available uh, in software, um, many of them use something called hysteresis to deal with this. So hysteresis is uh, a word that describes, um, I'm not sure what the origin of it is, but in signal processing we use it to describe uh, some sort of processing on a wave where we do something different when it's going up and something different when it's going down. We don't treat the same value, like a value of six decibels. It doesn't get treated the same way if it's six decibels on its way up compared to if it's six decibels on the way down. Um, so the, the idea with hysteresis in a noise gate is that you're going to say, uh, I have actually two thresholds. I have a threshold for closing the gate, and then I have uh, a higher threshold for opening the gate. So the gate will not close until it drops below the lower threshold, but then it won't open until I drop, I go above the high threshold. And that way uh, we can hopefully avoid this, um, this zippering thing. Now I've decided not to go with that route, so there's there's no hysteresis in this noise gate. And the reason is that as I was going through in my mind all of the ways that we could deal with this, I realized that no matter what method we choose, we end up kind of coming back to some of the same issues. That, for example, let's say we, we try to solve this, um, I call it zippering when the gate is opening and closing really fast. Let's say we try to, to solve that by using hysteresis. So if we do that, um, that will work uh, to some degree, but we're still going to have a problem when, um, like if you, if you look at this situation where the, the wave volume is quite high, this wave is going to pass through both of those thresholds every time it goes up and down. It's going gonna, it's gonna to pass the, um, the, the upper threshold and the lower threshold. And so technically you could still get a little bit of zippering. So 
the hysteresis alone isn't going to solve the problem. So hysteresis would then have to be combined with some sort of delay where we say, okay, we're not just going to open and close every time you cross these thresholds, but if you cross the, the um, lower threshold on the bottom, then we're going to wait a certain amount of time, like five milliseconds or something, and if you stay below it for five milliseconds, only then we're going to close down the, the filter. And then you're going to have to pass the upper threshold and stay there for a certain time, otherwise we're not opening it. And by the time we get all of that stuff done, um, we have a lot of very complex code to wrap your head around, and I think we get we can get lost in in the question of frequency. So ultimately, the 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 real issue that concerns us here is what's the lowest frequency that this noise gauge is going to work with, and that's that's really the the question we want to answer. Let me show you why that's important. So right now I'm I'm putting in a test signal at 20 hertz. I'm going to take it up to 100 hertz and run this again. So what we see now is that um, with this 100 hertz uh, wave, there's no, there's none of that distortion. There's no zippering going on when we close. Just, just for fun, let's go back to, let's go right down to 10 hertz and run this again. And let's observe. Now at 10 hertz, I'm, I'm getting this zippering problem, and you can see it right here. There's this, this extra high frequency noise. And when I go to the higher frequency, I'm not seeing that problem, even though I have all the same settings. I'm only getting the problem on these low frequencies because the wave needs to be quite slow before I get into that, that trouble. So um, rather than going with the hysteresis and delay route, I, I happened to be watching a video where someone was demonstrating a noise gate. I was watching, actually I was watching Anderton's TV, which is a cool channel if you're interested in amps and guitars. Um, and they were demonstrating a noise gate on a high gain amplifier. And they were very pleased with the way the noise gate was working. And as I was watching that, I was thinking, oh, that's funny. I wonder how you'd build a noise gate using just analog circuits. I mean, you could think of maybe some really complicated ways, but you know when, when engineers design those analog circuits, they always want to cut down on the number, on the number of parts. So you know they're going, to be, they're going to be very clever and they're going to come up with something very simple. So I spent some time thinking and asking myself, okay, so if I were, if I were going to do this without the digital stuff, so I don't have, uh, I don't have like a counter that can, that can say if I'm below this level, then count samples, count time until this happens and then I don't have any of that. All I've got is just voltages and filters. And I realized, yeah, there, of, of course there's a way to do it because people are doing it. Um, and so I said, well, just partly for fun, but also because the, I think there's, there's always something a little bit magical about analog, even if you're, even if you're actually building it in digital. Um, let's, let's do it that way uh, in software. So what we're doing instead of the hysteresis and the delay type of thing that you see um, other noise gates in software doing uh, is we're just using low pass filters uh, with a, a very a special design that allows them to switch on and off or allows me to switch between two filters so that I can have a higher frequency filter for the envelope filter when the, the attack is coming on, when the sound is, is on its way up and lower frequency when it's going down. And the reason I like that approach is because then I can set, uh, I can calculate either the time for the release time, or I can uh, also calculate the release frequency, which means that I can estimate what's the lowest frequency that's gonna be able to pass through this um, noise gate without, without zippering the gate open and shut. So actually what's going to happen in this analog design is it's always zippering the gate open and shut. So even, even if you're, you're playing at any frequency at all, as soon as the wave drops below the threshold, noise gate starts closing. But because of the low pass filter we've, we've put on the, the noise gate open and close control that, that uh, is, is operated by our envelope follower, because of that, um, the, it'll slow down that closing and it slows it down so much that below a certain frequency uh, oh, sorry above a certain frequency it's not able to make any 
any audible movement at all toward closing the gate, even though you know it sees the the level drop down and it's it's trying to close immediately, but it's it's so slow that it, it doesn't get there, um, and then you don't see this distortion. Um, so that's the that's the method that we are using, uh, partly just because I think it's cool, but also because I love the the level of control that we're getting um, over the frequency. Uh, so for example, if I set the release time at 50 milliseconds, it turns out that 50 milliseconds is exactly the period of oscillation of uh, a 20 hertz sine wave. Um, so let's let's go to 20. I've got release at 50 milliseconds. Let's go back, uh, get my test noise gate function, and put in a 20 hertz sine wave. Um, so you can see at 20 hertz, there's still a lot of um, zippering going on on the closing. But when I say a lot, this uh, this color gradient here is logarithmic. When you actually look at the wave, you don't see much. You don't really see much happening. There's like a little, a little bump at this point where the threshold is, and it doesn't get big until right here. Um, so I think well, when I looked at this, I was thinking, especially this last one, like that's that's a little bit more distortion than I'd like to see on my noise gate. And then I was I was going back and questioning myself and saying. Well, maybe we do need to do hysteresis, and maybe we do need to do um, uh, delays and that kind of thing. And I said to myself, "No, no, wait, wait, wait. You got to trust the uh, mathematics on these filters." Um, so the reason why it's coming through at 20 hertz is because when you put a, a cutoff, a filter cutoff frequency at 20 hertz, it actually starts rolling off a little before 20 hertz, and then takes quite quite a distance after 20 Hertz before it actually gets to zero so if we're if we're setting our release time at um, uh, where, where was that at uh, 50 milliseconds which corresponds to a frequency of 20 Hertz you're still going to get something leaking through up to uh, much higher value than that um, and so we, we did some adjustments in the filter I'm actually using a 10th order uh, filter to try to get it really focused so that it it uh, it cuts off hard and fast right at at that cutoff frequency uh, but it's it's not possible to do that perfectly and and as I went through thinking about this and I, and I was again I was questioning myself should I abandon this sort of analog approach and I said no I don't think so because um, what I would get if I went to a digital approach where I was looking at a delay, using a delay and a um, uh, some kind of hysteresis, is I could get into a situation where uh, I could I could lock it on to like an exact frequency where if you're even a little bit below that, then the noise gate will like start hard zippering where it's like really closing fast and opening fast, or I don't. And then I still smooth it out, and then that seems kind of redundant to be like, you know, using that method and the, that that digital complex method, and then saying, oh, but that's not good enough, so I'm I'm still going to filter on top of that. Um, so I think the solution here is to accept and understand that there's this trade-off that if I want a fast release time, I cannot run these base frequencies through it and expect it to not zipper a little bit as the as the gate is closing out. Um, on the other hand, uh, do I really need the noise gate to work absolutely noise free uh, right down to 20 hertz? And I think the answer is probably not. And furthermore, uh, our noise gate that we're, we're about to release has a, um, a high pass and low pass filter on the side chain input which means that if that's a problem for you to have it zippering at those frequencies, you could remove, you could filter out the low frequencies from the side chain. And then, then of course, that issue would hopefully not bother you anymore. So the only time that this zippering at 20 hertz would, um, would really mess you up is if you were actually trying to run a noise gate on a signal where the main sound you were trying to, trying to preserve was at 20 hertz, and I think that's 
that's very unlikely. Um, if you were if you were in that situation, I would probably just low pass filter the entire signal, and then the noise would be gone, and you wouldn't need a noise gate anyway. Um, so that's what we're doing. Um, and just for just for uh, double checking, um, so this is this is at 20 hertz with these particular settings. I'm I'm using uh, that 50 millisecond um, release time. Let's have a look at what happens when I'm up at 100 hertz for the, the tone frequency. There it updated. Is that it's coming through absolutely clean? And just to check, because this is important, um, when you're when you're using a noise gate like this, if the gate is zippering, there's a possibility, depending on how it's designed. Certainly, if it's designed the way we're designing this one there's a possibility that it's it's going to be zippering all the time. As I said, this one is. It's every time that the wave goes below the threshold, it starts to close. So if the filter that smooths, slows down that closing operation isn't uh, correctly designed, um, you're going to get this zippering all the time, even when you're at full volume. And that will just add a level of distortion to everything you do, which um, probably isn't wanted. I mean, all, there are always people who are looking for certain kinds of interesting distortion, but I, I doubt this is the one they're looking for. Um, so just for one last thing before we end the video, I want to compare this against what it looks like when we are not using the sine sweep, uh, not using the noise gate. And the reason I want to do that is I want to confirm that this, this kind of halo that you're seeing above the tone, that that's not uh, that's not coming from zippering in the noise gate, that that's just coming from the FFT um, function inside of Isotope. So it's just a visualization error. So to check that, we're going to turn the noise gate back off and reprocess this. Um, so now hopefully we've got, there it is, no noise gate. And you can see, I, I don't really see any change in the, in the halo above this this tone when we went um, when we went from the uh, noise gated version to the original input signal. So I think we'll end the video there. Um, I hope that we're going to be releasing this noise gate soon. Uh, and when I say soon, I mean like in the next day or two, um, because uh, we've been we're still working on the saturator. Um, but we have a team of four people in our company and. Uh, we have to run a lot of projects in parallel in order to ensure that everybody's busy all the time. So um, we've decided to start working in parallel on this noise gate while uh, other members of the team are waiting for me to continue uh, running tests and coding on the saturator. If you liked this video and you want to see more like this, hit subscribe so that you'll get notified next time we have a video coming up. And if you would, hit like for us. That helps our channel grow. And uh, we'll see you in the next video.